nursing it here. Today we're going to talk about hematology. That's the science or the study of the blood, blood forming organs and blood diseases. When we're talking about it in terms of the medical field, we're specifically looking at the treatment of blood disorders, malignancies, including types of hemophilia, leukemia, lymphoma, and sickle cell anemia. The hematologic system includes the blood, which consists of plasma and cells, the lymphatic system, and organs involved in blood formation and blood storage, such as the bones, the kidneys, the liver, and the spleen. Plasma is the blood fluid where albumin, globulins, and fibrinogen are dissolved in it. The cells we're most concerned with today are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. The primary roles of the hematologic system are to circulate oxygen, nutrients, hormones, and metabolic wastes protect against invasion of pathogens, and to maintain coagulation, fluid, and acid-base balance in body temperature. The average adult has about five to six liters of blood in their vascular system. The heart pumps or circulates the total volume every minute. Therefore, the average cardiac output is five to six liters per minute. If the blood volume or the number of oxygen-carrying red blood cells decreases, the body compensates by increasing the heart rate to maintain cardiac output. Hematopoiesis is the production of blood cells, which occurs in the red marrow of bones. In adults, the red marrow, named because it's full of red blood cells, is present in flat and irregular bones, like the sternum, the skull, the pelvis, and the shoulder girdle. In children, red marrow is present in all bones, but specifically in the long bones. As we age, fatty tissue or yellow marrow replaces the red marrow, decreasing our ability to create red blood cells, which causes anemia. White blood cells, which decreases our immune system and increases our infection risk, and platelets, which increases our risk for bleeding. Stem cells in the bone marrow are called pluripotent, meaning they have the ability to become any of the blood cells. Hormones signal the stem cells to become lymphoid, so either T or B lymphocytes and part of the immune system, or myeloid, which are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Red blood cells are also known as erythrocytes. You might recall that erythro means red. Red blood cells carry oxygen and assist in clot formation. Too few red blood cells is called anemia, and results in tissue hypoxia, so the cells can't get enough oxygen. White blood cells are also known as leukocytes. Leuco means white. White blood cells fight infection as part of the immune system and inflammatory response. Too few white blood cells is called leukopenia and results in an increased risk of infection. There are special types of white blood cells. Granulocytes include neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Neutrophils are phagocytes that fight off infection. Eosinophils kill parasites and mediate histamine response. And basophils release histamine and heparin during the inflammatory response. There are also agranulocytes, and these include the lymphocytes, which play a large role in our immune system and are responsible for transplant rejections, and the monocytes, which grow up to be macrophages. Platelets circulate through the bloodstream monitoring for endovascular injury and create platelet plugs to stop bleeding. They're an important component in the clotting cascade. Too few platelets is called thrombocytopenia and increases the risk of bleeding. The kidney is responsible for sending the hormone erythropoietin to the bone marrow to signal the pluripotent stem cells to make red blood cells. The spleen and the liver are also involved in blood formation. The spleen is made of both vascular and lymph tissue. The spleen filters blood, removing and breaking down old and malformed cells. It also stores white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Removal of the spleen, for medical or traumatic reasons, increases the risk of infection and sepsis for life. The liver stores large amounts of blood and iron necessary for blood formation, as well as producing and storing clotting factors. People with liver dysfunction have both clotting and bleeding 
disorders. Rapid destruction of red blood cells or impaired liver function so it can't remove bilirubin from the bloodstream results in an increased bilirubin level in the blood. What will we see with that? Jaundice. So where do we check for jaundice? If you notice jaundice sclera or yellowed sclera, the sclera can be yellow for reasons other than hyperbilirubinemia. So you should confirm the finding by checking the palate, the palms, and the skin. Ethnic pigmentation and some vitamins can change the color of the sclera, so always confirm your suspicions. Homeostasis is the multi-stepped process of blood clotting that can be triggered by intrinsic or extrinsic factors. Intrinsic factors include circulating debris or venous stasis, while extrinsic factors are trauma, inflammation, bacterial toxins, and foreign proteins. In the case of an injury, damage to a blood vessel initially causes localized vessel spasms and restricts or slows blood flow through the vessel. Chemical messengers cause platelet aggregation, which in turn creates a platelet plug and stimulates the clotting cascade. Next, a fibrin mesh is formed. Then the clot retracts, getting tighter and pulling the edges of the wound closer together. New cell growth is stimulated and the vessel wall is repaired. Once healed, fibrinolysis dissolves the clot. Anti-clotting forces include plasminogen and plasmin. So plasminogen is circulating around in the bloodstream and it becomes activated by plasminogen activators and thrombin, which transform it into plasmin, the activated form of plasminogen. Plasmin then digests fibrin, fibrinogen, and prothrombin. This is referred to as fibrinolysis. Our body has other safeguards in place. When the clotting cascade is activated, other anti-clotting substances, such as protein C, protein S, and antithrombin 3 help prevent the clots from becoming too large by either breaking down clotting factors or inactivating thrombin. People with protein C or protein S deficiencies tend to make blood clots, DVTs, PEs, and strokes. Age, gender, occupation, baseline liver, kidney, and bone health all play a role in normal hematopoiesis. Your hematologic assessment should include your routine questions, but focus on things like medications that can increase red blood cell destruction or suppress bone marrow function, leading to a decrease in red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Kidney failure causes a decrease in erythropoietin release and therefore a decrease in red blood cell formation. Nutrition is important because consistent levels of vitamin K intake is critical for patients who are on anticoagulants. And a diet that is high in fat and carbohydrates and low in proteins, vitamins, and iron increases the risk for anemia. In terms of family history, ask about clotting or bleeding disorders. Many are hereditary. Current health problems, we want to assess for signs and symptoms of hematologic disorders like swollen lymph nodes, easy bruising, fatigue, and dyspnea with exertion. Part of our assessment also includes evaluation of laboratory data. On our CBC, we will include red blood cells. So red blood cells start off as reticulocytes, which are immature red blood cells. For about two days, they circulate around as reticulocytes and then they become mature red blood cells. Hemoglobin and hematocrit are also measured and those can be impacted by hydration status. So fluid volume overload dilutes your hemoglobin and your hematocrit levels and fluid volume deficit concentrates them or makes them look higher than they actually are. Looking at the white blood cells, first evaluate the total number. If it's elevated, it could signal infection, and if it's low, it may signal immunosuppression. And then look at the differential. When there are increased neutrophils, it demonstrates that there's an infection. When there are increased bands or immature neutrophils, that tells us there's an acute infection. Decreased neutrophils 
also tells us the patient is immunosuppressed and at high risk for infection. A total white blood cell count less than five is called leukopenia, and neutropenia less than 500 microliters or 500 cells per microliter is at a person who's at severe risk for infection, and we would want to institute neutropenic. I lumped the labs related to clotting factors together here. Platelets range from 150,000 to 450,000 normally. And then other labs that are checked if the patient takes an anticoagulant are PT, INR, and PTT. The extrinsic clotting cascade is uh, impaired by Coumadin or Warfarin. The labs associated with this are prothrombin time or PT and the international normalized ratio or INR. The PT is used to test how fast blood clots, but it's not a reliable number because of the various lab machines that are used. Instead, the INR is considered the most reliable value. It divides the patient's PT by a standard PT for that machine, giving a ratio. If you can remember war for in, the war boats in WW2, World War II, were PT boats. And the strong R sound, war, is uh, the R and INR. The antidote for being overly anticoagulated with Coumadin is vitamin K. The K sound is the same in both. The intrinsic clotting cascade is impaired by heparin. The lab associated with this is the partial thromboblastin time, or PTT, also called activated partial thromboblastin time, or APTT, and those are two different normal values. If you can remember that heparin starts with a capital H, and that the two T's of the PTT line can line up on top of the H, that may help you remember that the lab value associated with heparin therapy is PTT or APTT. The antidote for being overly anticoagulated with heparin when the PTT is too high is protamine sulfate. The normal lab ranges for PTT and APTT are different depending on the lab and the patient's baseline. Other diagnostic tests that we might do for somebody with a hematologic condition include bone marrow aspiration. We do this to study the bone marrow of a patient to identify the presence of leukemia, malignancy, or to determine the cause of anemia. The most common site is the posterior superior iliac crest, or the pelvis, and the patient could be premedicated with Tylenol. Local anesthetic is used. And after the procedure, you just want to apply pressure for about five to 10 minutes after noodle removal to stop bleeding. So the nursing priority following a, a bone marrow aspiration is bleeding control. And then cover the site after bleeding is controlled. Monitor for signs of infection and bleeding or bruising, and then pain control with things like Tylenol, but avoid aspirin. Ice packs will help minimize bruising as well. For patient teaching, we want to teach them to watch for signs and symptoms of infection, but also to monitor every two hours for 24 hours to watch for bleeding and bruising and avoid activities that could result in trauma for at least 48 hours, two days. Age-related changes related to the hematologic system include a decrease in bone mass and a decrease in intracellular fluids. This decreases blood volume and liver function and leads to a decrease in albumin levels or that nice oncotic pressure. There's also a decrease in hematopoiesis and iron binding, so chronic anemia and an increased risk of infection and an increased risk of bleeding become more common as we age. Let's explore some of the more common hematologic problems. First, let's start with anemia. Anemia is the unmet cellular oxygen demands due to decreased red blood cells or impaired function of red blood cells. Essentially, when you have a decreased hemoglobin level, you end up with cellular hypoxia. The three most common clinical manifestations for all types of anemia include pallor, weakness or fatigue, and tachypnea or dyspnea at rest 
or um, even uh, dyspnea one exertion or rest with increased severity. So just for vocabulary, again, um, erythro or erythema is red, erythrocyte is a red cell. Erythropoiesis then is the carefully controlled balance of red blood cell manufacturing that should match the rate of red blood cell destruction. Erythropoietin again is the hormone released by the kidneys that stimulates erythropoiesis in response to hypoxia. So if the kidneys are not registering that there's enough oxygen in the blood that they're receiving, they will release additional erythropoietin. The nursing goals for the care of the patient with anemia include a hemoglobin and hematocrit that are adequate for cellular perfusion and clot formation, but we don't want to overshoot. So polycythemia or too many red blood cells actually increases the viscosity and increases the risk for clots. This carefully balanced process requires the correct building blocks properly functioning red marrow and properly formed red blood cells that can circulate in a safe environment. Anemia can result from a poor diet or malabsorption. We have lack of ingredients or missing the building blocks that leads to a decrease in red blood cells. Those that are created oftentimes have a change in size. So when we have microcytic or small cells in the labs, we will have a decreased MCV or mean corpuscular volume, meaning that the red blood cells are small in morphology. And these are associated with iron deficiency anemias. The primary cause of this in children is diet, and in the elderly is GI bleeding. Poor diet, such as with alcoholism, partial gastrectomy surgeries, and malabsorption syndromes are other common causes. Signs and symptoms of iron deficiency anemia include the weakness, pallor, fatigue, and activity intolerance, but also fissures at the corner of the mouth, kind of the hallmark sign of iron deficiency anemia. Macrocytic or increased mean corpuscular volume, large red blood cells, are associated with vitamin B deficiency anemias. These are primarily related also to poor diet. Vitamin B12 deficiency is also often related to gastric surgeries in people who cannot absorb B12 due to lack of intrinsic factor. B12 is also referred to as extrinsic factor. Signs and symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency anemia include pallor, jaundice, glossitis, or this smooth, beefy red tongue, fatigue, and weight loss. When intrinsic factor is missing, B12 deficiency is referred to as pernicious anemia. And the patient may also have paresthesias or numbness and tingling of the hands and the feet and poor balance. Patients with pernicious anemia cannot absorb oral B12 supplements. They are normalized first on injections and then can continue injections or transition to sublingual preparations or nasal gel. Folic acid, which is also vitamin B9 deficiency anemia, may also result from diet, malabsorption, as well as medications like oral contraceptives, anticonvulsants, and methotrexate, and chronic alcoholism. The signs and symptoms of B9 deficiency are similar to B12 deficiency because B12 activates the enzymes that help develop normal red blood cells using folic acid. However, folate deficiency does not have paresthesias. It's critical to not give folic acid to patients with an undiagnosed type of anemia because it may mask the signs and symptoms of pernicious anemia, which can lead to permanent damage. Anemia can also be the result of bone marrow disease, where not enough red blood cells are produced, resulting in what's referred to as aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia is most often the result of long-term exposure to toxic substances, medications, radiation, or infection. The stem cells do not produce adequate supplies of any of the blood cells, resulting in what's called pancytopenia, pan meaning all. So too few red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. When pancytopenia is present, the patient will have anemia, too few red blood cells with the pallor, fatigue, dyspnea, and activity intolerance, 
but also leukopenia, too few white blood cells, and the body's ability to generate an immune response is decreased, so the patient's at risk for infection and may experience frequent or even severe infections. And then thrombocytopenia, too few platelets. The body then cannot create platelet plugs or activate the clotting cascade as normal, and they will experience petechiae, bleeding in like the gums or puncture sites, hematuria, etc. These clients are at extreme risk for bleeding. Nursing care of the patient with pancytopenia focuses on safety. Focus on infection control, good hand washing, prevention, injury prevention to avoid things that could cause bleeding, and then the appropriate medications and blood transfusions to correct the disorder. Anemia can also be the result of a genetic disorder where red blood cells are formed incorrectly and then destroyed quickly. The normal lifespan of a red blood cell is about 120 days. Each erythrocyte contains hundreds of thousands of hemoglobin molecules and iron. The oxygen binds loosely to the hemoglobin so it can dissociate easily at a cell that needs oxygen. Interestingly, gases such as carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide bind with a much higher affinity to hemoglobin and have a harder time dissociating or letting go. Genetic and autoimmune disorders can speed up the destruction of red blood cells by the spleen, the liver, and the tissues, leading to a decrease in the number of circulating red blood cells. Sickle cell disease is an autosomal recessive genetic hemoglobin disorder that results in the formation of abnormal hemoglobin or hemoglobin S that causes the red blood cells to sickle in response to hypoxia or poor perfusion, leading to clumping and vaso-occlusive events that obstruct blood flow to tissues and organs. This mutation was initially a protective measure in places with malaria where sickle cell trait or a carrier uh, was protective of malaria, then became a disease causing anemia when enough of the population had the trait to begin having children with two recessive alleles. In the United States, we most often see sickle cell disease in patients of African or Middle Eastern descent. People with sickle cell disease have at least 40% of the red blood cells created with the deformed hemoglobin S. The deformed red blood cells are usually destroyed within 10 to 20 days of formation, leading to a significant decrease in their circulating red blood cells. This is referred to as a hemolytic anemia. The most common trigger for a sickling episode, which can lead to crisis, is hypoxia or dehydration or infection, but also venous stasis, pregnancy, alcohol consumption, high altitudes because of the hypoxia, low or high body temperatures because it impacts the oxygen dissociation, acidosis because it impacts oxygen dissociation, strenuous exercise, emotional stress, and anesthesia. The patient with sickle cell disease experiences chronic anemia, pain, disability, organ damage, and increased risk of infection, and even early death as a result of poor blood perfusion. Care of the patient with sickle cell disease who is not in crisis focuses on prevention, pushing the fluids, avoiding infection, no nicotine use, and avoiding triggers. This includes teaching parents to seek medical attention immediately for any respiratory illnesses and to monitor closely for signs of crisis in their children. A splenectomy may be needed for sequestered cells in the spleen or splenomegaly. Observe the abdomen closely for signs of hemorrhage following surgery. Care of the patient in crisis includes oxygen, pain medication, IV fluids, remove any restrictive clothing, avoid pressure to the extremities, don't leave that blood pressure cuff on the arm, hourly perfusion checks of all the fingers and toes, including cap refill, pulse oximetry, color sensation mobility. Do not withhold opiate pain medications from patients with substance use disorders who are in sickle cell crisis. They need pain control. Another autoimmune disorder is the G6PD deficiency anemia. And this is also common to patients with African or Middle Eastern descent. It is an X-linked recessive disorder expressed in males and mild partial expression in female carriers. G6PD is um, an enzyme that stabilizes the cell membrane and 
when people with this deficiency first create red blood cells, there is some in the red blood cells. So the, the cell is okay at first, um, but then if the person is exposed to certain medications, toxins, or infections, the G6PD is depleted and the membrane loses stability and breaks down rapidly after exposure. Typically then those red blood cells are destroyed within seven to 10 days of exposure leading to massive hemolysis and then rapid development of jaundice because of this huge spike in serum bilirubin. After the acute event, the patient will be better once new red blood cells are formed until they're exposed again to medications, toxins, or infection and experience another um, you know, event. Hemolytic anemias can result from other reasons as well. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia occurs when the patient's immune system recognizes the protein tags on the red blood cells as foreign and attacks them. Other causes of hemolytic anemia include medications, trauma like CPR, a VAD, a ventricular assist device, or an intraaortic balloon pump, central lines, pacemakers, portacaths, even just IV catheters, anything that causes turbulence or friction or trauma to red blood cells will increase the damage to the cell wall and enhance the rate of destruction. So identifying the underlying cause really is the first step in correcting anemia. So to review, erythropoietin stimulates production of new red blood cells from the bone marrow. Iron is required for oxygen carrying, vitamin B12 is required for red blood cell synthesis, and folic acid is required for the production of DNA and RNA. The kidneys usually stimulate the red blood cell production by releasing erythropoietin. So we talked about you know, if you have kidney damage or um, if the kidneys uh, aren't well perfused, then you know we might have a problem with erythropoietin uh, release. Or if we have a problem with uh, bone marrow itself, then we might have a problem responding to that hormone. The bone marrow needs the building blocks to form the red blood cells. So iron for oxygen carrying, B12 for RBC synthesis, and folate as well. Iron can stain the teeth and will cause dark, tarry stools, and that's normal. So we want to kind of troubleshoot that. And then uh, B12, you can only administer orally if the person still has intrinsic factor. Otherwise, it needs to be given either sub-Q, intranasally, or sublingually. And folic acid is very critical for normal DNA and RNA synthesis, and we know that's also important in fetal development and prevention of neural tube defects. Again, remember, don't give folic acid to people who have pernicious anemia, so always diagnose the problem first before starting treatment. Iron administration in pediatrics can be um, challenging. It should be administered with vitamin C because it requires an acid to be absorbed. So ascorbic acid is vitamin C. Mixing it with water or juice is great, and then using a straw to avoid the iron coming in contact with the teeth and staining the teeth is important as well. You can give it with food if it upsets the stomach, but don't mix it with dairy or calcium. So if, again, if you're mixing it with orange juice, make sure that it's not fortified with calcium uh, when you mix it with juice, but don't mix it with calcium or dairy because that actually uh, binds to the iron and prevents absorption. And then place where the child cannot reach it because iron is the most common cause of pediatric poisoning um, and death related to overdose reported in the United States. And iron itself causes metabolic acidosis, shock, seizures, and death. There are other medications that we can give to uh, stimulate the pluripotent stem cells to generate specific cells. These are synthetic hormones that trigger the hematopoiesis process. These medications enable patients receiving chemotherapy to get higher doses, or they could decrease the time in between chemotherapy and decrease recovery time after transplant or radiation therapy. And in the case of the colony stimulating factors, it stimulates the immune system, which then can fight off the bad cells. Erythropoietic drugs stimulate the production of red blood cells and are used to decrease anemia. And these are things like epoetin alpha and darbopoietin alpha, like uh, 
uh, epigen and procrit. Calling these stimulating factors stimulate the production of white blood cells and are used to decrease neutropenia. So these are filgrastim, pegfilgrastim, and sargramostim. And um, you know, neupogen is probably the most common one that you've heard of. And then platelet promoting drugs stimulate the production of platelets and are used to decrease thrombocytopenia. Um, New mega is probably the most common one that you've heard of, but uh, they're not used very frequently because of the risk of clotting if um, they overshoot their goal. So there are some common adverse effects to all hematopoietic drugs, and those include things like edema, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, rash, hair loss, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, fever, blood dyscrasias means like changes or abnormal lab values, headache, and bone pain. So of note, which is really important, is that epigen can cause um, hypertension because when you increase the number of red blood cells in the intravascular space, you increase the oncotic pulling pressure, which will draw more fluid into the intravascular space, raising the blood volume, which will raise the blood pressure. And giving epigen to a patient who has a normal hemoglobin or a hemoglobin of 12 or higher can cause an acute MI. So you can give them a heart attack or you can give them a stroke. And this practice is referred to as blood doping. There are some contraindications to our hemopoietic drugs. A known allergy, if you have normal labs, so you have normal functioning myeloid cells in the marrow, so your pluripotent stem cells are making your normal myeloid cells. Um, you don't want to give filgrastim to a patient who has an active infection, and you don't want to give epigen to a patient who has a normal or elevated hemoglobin. Interactions, so this is important also to know, is that you don't give your, like neupogen, your colony stimulating factors, and your myelosuppressive drugs, like your chemotherapy, within 24 hours of each other because they'll actually cancel each other out. So if you have a patient who's in the hospital and they're going over for chemo treatment while they're an inpatient and you have orders to give any of these uh, hemopoietic drugs, then you want to make sure that you know, you're clarifying the orders and um, you're, you're clear on the timing. So moving away from the lack ofs and getting to the too many's, um, polycythemia is too many red blood cells. And so it's a condition of having too many. There can be primary polycythemia, like polycythemia vera, which is an actual disease process. And then there can be secondary polycythemia, which occurs when the kidneys are receiving chronically hypoxic um, blood, such as with patients who have end-stage emphysema and the kidneys then are cranking out erythropoietin and the bone marrow is making a lot of extra red blood cells in response to a chronic hypoxic state. Typically that's related to either respiratory or heart, like congenital heart disease kind of thing. When we have too many red blood cells, the blood viscosity increases and the cells that are, are created with polycythemia vera are malformed and cannot carry oxygen well. So I have crowding but not good oxygen carrying capacity. Small vessels can become obstructed. Clots form because when red blood cells stay still, they get into trouble. So we get thrombosis and then tissues become hypoxic from lack of oxygen carrying capacity as well as lack of circulation. This leads to clubbing from kind of a chronic hypoxia, especially in the periphery. So you might see this in the fingers and the toes. Acute tissue infarcts, necrosis, um, and uh, the heart, the spleen, the kidneys are at the greatest risk of this. Um, the person can actually end up dying from, you know, uh, organ failure because of polycythemia and kind of uh, occlusion of blood flow to the heart, the spleen, or the kidneys. Treatment includes therapeutic phlebotomy. So we draw off units of blood, but they cannot be blood donors because this is not well-formed red blood cells. This is like, you know, 
dangerous blood. Um, apheresis is the pro process of hooking somebody up to, well, similar to a dialysis machine where you take the blood out of a person, you put the plasma back in, but you keep the cells out that you don't want them to get or that you want to collect. So in this case, we would filter out the red blood cells, then put their plasma back in. And that's good because that keeps them hydrated and won't give them like secondary complications or problems related to um, phlebotomy and donating uh, units of blood. Hydration is really critical to decrease that viscosity. You want to promote venous return to decrease thromboses. Um, use anticoagulants. Stop smoking because that causes vasoconstriction. And then stay warm because being cold causes vasoconstriction as well. So changing gears again, let's talk about some of the cancers related to the hematologic system. So leukemia is cancer of the white blood cells. Leukopenia is the term for increased white blood cells. And leukemia occurs when there's an abundance of immature or ineffective white blood cells in the marrow. This crowds the marrow, leading to anemia and thrombocytopenia as well. Basically, the body is selecting for, with the pluripotent stem cells, selecting for white blood cells almost exclusively and not making enough red blood cells to platelets. This causes uh, frequent infections because even though there are a ton of white blood cells, they are immature and ineffective and cannot fight off infection. And it's important then to protect the patient from um, injury in terms of like skin openings, things like that, that be could become a portal of entry for infection. So avoid skin injuries, rectal temps, or suppositories because those can abscess and the patient can become septic. In addition, then, we also have the complications of anemia, pallor, fatigue, dyspnea, decreased activity intolerance, and thrombocytopenia, petechiae, bleeding gums, and hematuria. So we want to cluster our care to prevent um, increasing the fatigue and shortness of breath, and then we also want to uh, promote safety. Now we want to monitor our CBC to watch for a decrease in our H and H with the patient who has thrombocytopenia, because that would give us a clue that they were bleeding internally, or that they had a lot of little bleeds all over the place, and it was accumulating in uh, enough accumulation, I guess, to say that they had significant blood loss. The treatment of leukemia is three-pronged, chemotherapy, radiation, and bone marrow transplant. Patients receiving chemotherapy may complain of stomatitis or oral pain, and um, you should provide you know, gentle, meticulous mouth care. Soft, bland foods may help. Hydration is really important. It also increases pancytopenia, so chemotherapy suppresses the activity of the bone marrow, leading to an overall decrease in the production of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So watch for bleeding, infection, fatigue, and shortness of breath. Radiation also causes fatigue and can further suppress the bone marrow. But the primary complaint in patients who are receiving radiation therapy is extreme fatigue. As far as skin care goes, patients who receive radiation therapy don't usually get burned, but they might have some mild skin irritation. So just use a gentle, like water-based lubricant or lotion um, on the skin. And then bone marrow transplants. So pain management is important and observe for bleeding and infection just like with the person who was getting the uh, bone marrow aspiration. If they're just getting a stem cell transplant though, that's through an IV. An increase in just white blood cells may mean that they have an infection. So we wanna monitor their labs really carefully in that kind of post-transplant period. And an increase in white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets means that though the marrow has engrafted and that's a win like that i mean that means that they're getting better and that should make us super excited so just a reminder in terms of care of the immunosuppressed patient people who have really low white blood cell counts or who are neutropenic febrile neutropenia is a medical emergency just like a heart attack or stroke we want to avoid exposing them to infection at all cost Avoid raw fruits or veggies, no standing water, so no water in a cup for longer than 15 minutes. Avoid crowds and sick visitors, fresh plants and flowers, 
and again, no rectal temps or suppositories. A temperature elevation of even a single degree above baseline should be considered an infection until proven otherwise. So the myelodysplastic syndromes cause pancytopenia, which are too few of all the cells in the blood. And if the patient is anemic, we would give the epigen or the procrit, the epoetin alpha. Again, pallor fatigue, dyspnea, chronic hypoxia will lead to clubbing. If they have leukopenia or too few white blood cells, again, frequent infections, right? And we could give neutrophil stimulators such as neupogen or leukine. And if they have thrombocytopenia or too, through, too few thrombocytes or too few platelets, um, they're increased risk for bleeding and it's important to avoid any unnecessary venipunctures and monitor their H&H &H carefully. So we can use platelet stimulators for these like Numega and N-plate. And we use those for uh, patients with like ITP or patients who um, are actively like bleeding or having uh, significant problems, not just a low platelet count with no other reason. Specifically care of the patient with thrombocytopenia should be reconsidered. Um, bleeding precautions are critical. Safety is always a, a primary concern of you know, making sure that the environment is clutter free, using a soft bristle toothbrush or a tooth that, using an electric razor and never a blade, using a stool softener to avoid um, you know, any hard stools or if anything scratching, no rectal temps or suppositories. During acute thrombocytopenia, no intercourse, avoid blowing the nose, and avoid injections and non-essential blood drugs. Some other thrombocyte disorders or clotting problems include autoimmune thrombocytopenic purpura, which used to be called idiopathic thrombocytic purpura, or ITP. And this is when we have an increased destruction of platelets by the spleen, um, and uh, because of the um, immune system recognizes them as foreign. Therapy includes immunosuppression. Platelet transfusions are only given if life-threatening bleeding occurs. Safety really is key, again, to prevent injury and bleeding. The splenectomy may be necessary in these patients as well, so monitor postoperatively for intra-abdominal hemorrhage, measure the abdominal girth, and monitor for distension. The patient will have an increased risk of infection due to removal of the lymphatic part of the spleen, and it's important to give the pneumococcal, meningococcal, and haemophilus influenza vaccines two weeks before or after surgery. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP, is when we have excessive activation of the platelet aggregation, leading to too few platelets in circulation. In times of trauma, the body then cannot protect itself, very similar to DIC. Uh, we can use aspirin to decrease improper clotting, and really our goals are to monitor for bleeding and protect from injury. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT, um, is an immunity-mediated clotting disorder. It can occur with any type of heparin, but is most common with unfractionated heparin. The IgG response activates platelets in the clotting cascade, causing things like deep vein thromboses and pulmonary emboli. It's treated with direct thrombin inhibitors like agatroban and bivalrudin, which is angiomax, and again, monitor for bleeding and protect from injury. So hemophilia kind of lumps in here, but is a different beast. It's an X-linked recessive trait. So it's a chronic disease where there's a deficiency of clotting factors that lead to abnormal bleeding responses after trauma. The body can form platelet plugs, but not a stable fibrin clot, so they'll continue to bleed. Bleeding is slow to stop, even from a minor cut, and can become fatal if not treated. Chronic bleeding into joints like the hip and the knee leads to degenerative joint disease. For children, we focus on education and prevention. With hemophilia, IM injections and immunizations are okay. Education about prevention and management are key in the kind of treatment or teaching of hemophilia. Avoid injury, gentle hygiene, wear an ID bracelet, practice good nutrition, 
teach parents and the patient how to assess for bleeding, and this includes hemarthrosis, so warm, painful, swollen joints with decreased range of motion, black tarry stools, cola colored urine, coffee ground, emesis, prolonged nosebleeds, headaches, irritability, acting strangely. So we will look for things like epistaxis, hematomas, hemarthrosis, GI bleeds, and post-surgical bleeding. If they have rescue medications at home, like desmopressin, which is DDAVP, we want to teach them about how to use that. Treatment overall for bleeding or injury for the patient with hemophilia includes administering the missing factor and then administering antifibrinolytics, which are also called hemostatic drugs. So this includes tranexamic acid or TXA, which is also called Amicar, and then desmopressin or DDAVP. TXA will stabilize a clot that exists. So if they have a platelet uh, plug, but they haven't found, like really formed a fibrin uh, mesh clot, TXA will help stabilize that versus uh, DDAVP actually enhances platelet aggregation and promotes clot formation. So DDAVP or desmopressin can make new clots versus TXA or Amicar stabilizes clots that exist. For hemarthrosis, so blood in the joint, you want to rest it, so immobilize it, um, compress it, elevate it, ice it, treat pain with things like Tylenol, steroids, and opiates. We avoid NSAIDs, including aspirin, because they further impair platelet aggregation and increase the risk of bleeding. Lymphomas are cancers of the lymph node. There's two types. There's Hodgkin's, which has Reed-Sternberg cells, and there's non-Hodgkin's that has no Reed-Sternberg cells. They are diagnosed by biopsy of the lymph node to check for the presence of Reed-Sternberg cells and obviously the presence of cancer. In Hodgkin's lymphoma, the lymph nodes, usually in the upper body, spread in a very predictable pattern. They have swollen, painless nodes. They're kind of rubbery and fixed. Weight loss, night sweats, persistent fever and malaise, cough, dyspnea, chest pain, recurrent infections, itching, and an enlarged spleen. In non-Hodgkin's, again, there's no Reed-Sternberg cells, metastases is common and spread is very disorganized. The signs and symptoms are the same, but typically it's diagnosed later on and after it's widespread. So the uh, prognosis is better for Hodgkin's lymphoma than with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Both um, are biopsied and then staged. And then chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery are options for both of them as well. Risk factors for the development of lymphoma include HIV infection and immunosuppression, so other types of cancer, chemotherapy, and then other chronic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, lupus, other things where the person would be on immunosuppressive medications. And lastly, but of course not least, is multiple myeloma, which is cancer of the B lymphocytes, or oftentimes referred to as cancer of the plasma cells. This is an overabundance of abnormal plasma cells that crowd the bone marrow. Again, the pluripotent stem cells are selecting um, for B lymphocytes and not making enough than red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. This causes pancytopenia and crowding the cancer invades the bone, forming these really painful tumors and hypercalcemia as the bony matrix is broken down. The loss of bone integrity results in pathological fractures, so the person's just standing and they experience a hip fracture. Hypercalcemia can cause acute kidney injuries and is treated with like fluid initially um, to kind of dilute the calcium level. Therapy for multiple myeloma includes chemotherapy, which may achieve remission, but is not curative. Radiation, which may shrink tumors, but is not curative. And then pain management really is key for all these pathological fractures and bone tumors. Refer to hospice and palliative care, especially for pain management when the disease progresses and becomes more advanced. As always, thank you for watching. I hope you have a great night.